Hello and welcome to Total Destruction Volume 1, Fracturing. In this first tutorial, you will learn everything you need to know to fracture your geometry in preparation for rigid body dynamic simulations, particle simulations, and even fluid dynamic simulations. Before we actually start fracturing our geometry, let's talk about some do's and don'ts to consider before creating destruction, especially rigid body dynamic simulations. Also, let's get acquainted with this minifigure geometry that will be included with the course. Before I show you the minifigure geometry, let me open another file that I have prepared beforehand called Test Geometry. The file will also be included with the course. So here I have a switch node and to it I have connected five different geometries. A box, a sphere, a wall, an open box and a somehow tangled sphere. So let me explain some things that you need to be careful or mindful of before you start creating fracturing. And especially if you're going to create rigid body dynamics, there's a few basic concepts that you need to check before you start working. The first thing I want to talk about is a concept of watertight geometry. I will select my switch node and change to geometry number zero, which is just a standard box. And below the null, I will connect a subdivide node. Notice how the box has been completely rounded as expected. But if we switch to geometry number three, you will notice how one of the corners is not being rounded as the rest. The reason why this is happening is because we have an open corner here and you can check that by pressing the S key, selecting this corner point and then pressing T to transform it. So if I move this point upward, you will notice how here we have a few open edges. Whereas in the standard box, we have completely closed geometry or watertight geometry. So if I try to select this corner point and translate it, you will notice how this is one unique point which makes a completely closed geometry. Watertight geometry is ideal for rigid body dynamic simulations, whereas open geometries can sometimes lead to some trouble while simulating and especially when fracturing with Boolean based techniques. Another thing that you have to be mindful of is crossing or intersecting geometry. If you take a look at this sphere to which I added some extreme noise, you will notice how there's some faces that are shaded in a different way. This is very useful because it shows us where the faces are intersecting or where the faces are pointing backwards. This can also lead to some trouble when fracturing or when simulating with rigid body dynamics. Now that we've talked about a few things that we need to avoid when fracturing, let's get acquainted with this minifigure digital asset that's included with your file. First of all, I will show you how to install it just in case you haven't done it. For now, I will remove this node and go to File, Import, Houdini Digital Asset, and I will browse to where my file is saved. In this case, the file will be saved in Example Files, Chapter 1, OTLs. So just double click on the Dan Minifigure version 1, and then click and Install and Create. Now every time you press the Tab key and type Dan Minifigure, you will be able to find this OTL and create an instance of the figure. The minifigure has a few basic properties. For example, you can turn off the helmet, the visor, the backpack, or even add materials per component. For example, you could add a separate material for the head, the torso, the arms, etc. Another very useful feature is that the figure comes divided into groups. So if you click on the information icon in the node, you will notice how we have, in this case, nine different primitive groups, one for the head, one for the pelvis, the torso, etc. 
Now the CT prefix is used for all the center pieces. The LT prefix is used for the pieces on the left and the RT is used for the pieces on the right. Now that we are acquainted with our minifigure, let's create a small exercise that will show us the importance of a very basic concept in fracturing, the name attribute. So let's create an empty geometry node. Let's rename it minifigure. And let's dive into the node. I will press tab and start typing Dan minifigure and press enter to create a minifigure node. Although this volume will not focus on rigid body dynamic simulations, I will create a very simple setup that will let us test how this geometry reacts to some forces and some collisions. So I will go back to the object context and I will look for my rigid bodies toolbar and with my geometry selected I'm going to click on RBD fractured object. Now whenever you get this prompt I recommend that you always use RBD packed object which is a newer way of simulating and a more efficient way to do it. So I will click here on RBD packed object and two new nodes will be generated, or actually one new node, the auto dot networks. And inside my minifigure node, there are three new nodes created. The rest node, the setup packed primitives, and the dot import node that will fetch the simulated geometry back into the geometry node. So for now, let's not worry about how the rigid body dynamic simulation works. We will see this in detail in volume two. For now, let's just go back to the object context and see how the simulation is working. So I'm going to play the animation. So for now, the mini figure just falls into infinity. And we can see there's some gravity, so that's fine. The thing is, I don't want him to fall indefinitely. So I'll go now to the collisions toolbar and create a ground plane. So you can control click on the ground plane icon and it will automatically uh, be set to the auto dot network. Now let's click play. And notice how now all the pieces of the character are falling independently, almost as if the character was completely unglued or as if the pieces were not attached to each other. So let's try to fix this. First of all, let me move the character up and probably rotate it a bit just to get a more interesting result. Again, let's play the animation. Okay, so here we have again, all the pieces are breaking apart. Now, let's dive back into the minifigure node. And again, let's see what's happening here. So, I have my geometry, then the rest node, and then the assemble node, which is packing the geometry to prepare the geometry to be simulated in the rigid body dynamics. But notice how this create name attribute is on. So for now, let's turn this attribute off and re-simulate to see what happens. I'm going to click here on the real time toggle just to see the animation in real time and press play. So notice how now the pieces are not breaking apart. Again, if we were to turn on the create name attribute, the pieces would break apart. 
So let's open the geometry spreadsheet to see what's happening under the hood. And you'll notice how this assemble node is adding the name attribute to every single point of the packed primitives. And the rigid body simulation is using each individual piece as a different object in the simulation. Now, a very important thing to consider is that although these are point attributes, we could override these attributes here on our geometry on the primitive level. That way we can define which pieces will break apart and which pieces will remain together. So let's do that now. I'm going to go back to my scene view. And before the geometry is packed here, when we create the geometry, I will add the name attribute manually. So I will rewind the animation. And this is something that can be done in several ways. The way I prefer is through an attribute wrangler. So I will press tab and type attribute wrangler. press enter and I will connect the node just below my geometry. Click here on the display render and I will change the color of the node so I'll press C and select this purple color and press C again to hide the swatches. Another thing that I will do is change the name to set group zero. So a very important thing as we mentioned earlier is that the name attribute should be added to the primitives not to the points. So I will change this run over option to primitives and I will type the following code s at name which is the name of the attribute and I'm typing S before the at sign because the name attribute is a string or in other words, text. And now to define a value, I need to type equals, open quotes and type the name I want to add or the value that the name attribute will have. In this case, I can call it piece, zero, close quotes close parentheses and I will type semicolon to finish the line of code and to evaluate I will press control enter and actually I don't need this parentheses I will re-evaluate the code and now it's working so <coughs> let's click here on the information icon and notice how the primitives now have a name attribute and if we open the geometry spreadsheet and click here on the primitives component you will note how all the pieces now are named piece zero because the wrangler is operating on all of the primitives on the geometry so Let's see what happens now if I re-simulate my geometry. So I will rewind back up a little bit and press play. So here we're back on square one. The thing is that if you select the assemble node uh, first of all, we forgot to turn off the create name attribute. Since we are now assigning the attributes manually, we can turn off the create name attribute in the assemble node. But most importantly, if you scroll down to where the transfer attribute is, we need to transfer the name attributes from the incoming geometry. So let's play the animation again. And 
since we only have one single piece name, which is P0, the entire object will be treated as a single piece within the simulation. So let's try this. I will add a few different name pieces and let's see if we are able to detach certain parts of the character in a more controlled way. So first of all, uh, let's change the name from set group to set piece because we're not creating groups, we're, uh, we're creating uh, a name attribute called piece. And let's copy this node by pressing Ctrl C and then paste it with Ctrl V. And let's connect it here on the main tree. And let's change the name of this attribute to piece one. And I will select a specific group so remember that the minifigure comes pre-configured with several groups. So I will click here on the group drop down and let's select the helmet, for example, or the visor. And now the visor has the name attribute piece one. The rest of the pieces are called piece zero. So again, let's simulate. And now the visor is breaking apart and the rest of the figure remains as a single piece. So in this way, you could create any combination of pieces that your shot requires. Let's try adding a few more pieces before we continue. So again, I will copy the attribute Wrangler paste it, I will change the name to piece 2 and change the group to let's say the left arm and let's also add the left hand. Finally let's make another piece so I will copy again, paste change the name to piece 3 and this time let's select say the backpack and simulate now by just manually adding the piece attribute to the pieces that we want to break apart we can have great control of how the simulation will react. And this will be very important when directing your destruction effects. Now that we've understood the importance of the name attribute, let's go ahead and fracture some geometry. In Houdini, we have many ways of fracturing geometry, and without a doubt, one of the most important ones is the Voronoi fracture. And in my opinion, one of the fastest and most stable ways to fracture geometry. Let's start with a simple exercise before jumping into more complex geometry. First of all, I will control click on the sphere tool, dive into its node, and I will also change the primitive type to polygon. I will also increase the frequency to 20 just to have a little bit more resolution. Now I will tap and type Voronoi fracture to lay down a Voronoi node and I will connect it to the sphere. Now if you notice and click here on the Voronoi fracture visibility icon, the sphere will disappear and we get an error so if you click here on the error symbol, you'll notice that there's a text saying not enough sources specified. So the Voronoi fracture is expecting points to generate individual cells. So these points we need to input into the node. And there's many ways of generating points. The easiest and fastest way is to use the scatter node. So I'm going to connect a scatter node just below the sphere. For now, I will reduce the 
total count to let's say 100 and connect the scatter node into the second input of the Voronoi fracture. Now if you look close enough we have generated new divisions and if we connect an exploded view node you will notice how now for every single point that we generated with a scatter node we have a new piece from the Voronoi fracture and as I mentioned before you can generate these points in any way you want in this case I'm using a scatter and by default the scatter node will generate points only on the surface of the input geometry if you take a look at the points that were generated with this scatter they are only lying on the outer surface of the sphere which is fine but sometimes you will want to create interior detail when you're dealing with very thick geometry for example a very thick wall or perhaps a collapsing floor or bridge to generate interior points we can create a volume and use that volume to scatter the points so let me add some space here and I will lay down an ISO offset node which will generate a standard volume and I will increase the resolution or the sampling divisions to 60 just to have a better contour or a volume that better resembles my original sphere now if we connect the ISO offset to the scatter notice how we will also have points inside the volume so the scatter node when detecting a volume it will use the density of this volume to scatter the points within it so now if we take a look at the resulting pieces you will notice how we have interior pieces that will look much more natural when creating destruction now as mentioned before every fracturing technique has its pros and cons in case of the Voronoi fracture it is a very fast tool and it can easily generate many many pieces it also has the advantage of being able to handle almost any type of geometry even open geometry for example planes or concave geometry on the other hand the greatest disadvantage of the Voronoi fracture is that it has these very distinctive cell patterns so if you take a close look at the individual pieces they look almost like crystals or with very geometric shapes and there are many ways to address this and to alleviate these problems that we will see in future videos for now just consider that Voronoi fracture will be your main fracturing tool now that we have created our first Voronoi fracture let's dive into the Voronoi's parameters and take a closer look at the possibilities of the node we will also create some interesting patterns based on points distribution so as usual let's start with a very simple geometry I will create a box dive into the geometry node and change the size to 8 meters in X 2 meters in Y and 0.4 meters in Z I will also change the center to 1 meter now I will lay down my Voronoi fracture node so I will tab then type Voronoi press enter and connect the Voronoi fracture to my box so last time we used a scatter node to create our points on the surface of the sphere to generate our fractured pieces this time I will replace the scatter with a point from volume node 
and I will connect the box to this node. So you'll notice how now we have hundreds of points organized in a very regular way. Actually, if we take a look at the front view by pressing spacebar 3, you will notice that this is a grid of points. We can now press spacebar 4 to take a look on the right side. And again, here each point is separated by this value. The point separation here will determine the distance between each point. And this is very useful. So for now, I will go back to my perspective by pressing spacebar 1. And we know that the thickness of this wall is 0.4 meters. So I will change the point separation to half of this value, 0.2, just to have one point centered on the wall. And the rest of the points will be aligned to the surface of the box. So let's connect the points to the Voronoi fracture and let's see what happens. So just make sure to click on the visibility icon of the Voronoi node. Now, instead of having the original cell pattern that comes from a random distribution of points, we have regular squares. In this case, the squares are being generated by this very uniform division of the points. And this is very useful to create things like tiles or bricks or even floor and rock patterns. So before we continue, I want to show you two very important attributes of the Voronoi fracture. And for that, I'm going to lay down again an exploded view just to be able to see the individual pieces. And I will zoom out just a bit. So notice how the exploded view has this piece attribute and it's set to name. So where this this so where did this name attribute come from? It was generated when we added the Voronoi fracture. So let me select my box and open the geometry spreadsheet and take a look at the primitives section. You will notice how for now we have no attributes for the primitives. And after attaching the Voronoi node, we have three new attributes. One is the name attribute, and the other two are group attributes. One is called inside, and the other is called outside. And these three attributes are very useful when generating our destruction materials or even rigid body dynamic simulations. So let's take a closer look at our geometry. Again, I'll, I will go back to my exploded view. And each one of these boxes will have a different name attribute. So let me generate a visualizer real quick. So I will right click on the visualization node. Then I will click on the plus icon to create a new marker. And this marker will show me the name attribute. So type name on the label and on the attribute as well. So let's zoom into the individual pieces. And you will notice how every face of each cube has the exact same name. In this case, piece 304 for this cube. And every face of the cube will share the same name attribute. And again, this attribute was generated automatically by the Voronoi fracture. And as we already know, this name attribute will be very important when we start creating our rigid body dynamics. Another very interesting thing is that the Voronoi fracture has automatically created two groups. And you can see the names of these groups here. The interior group will be called inside. The exterior group will be called outside. And what this interior group means 
is the new faces that were generated with the fracture. So let's take a look at the exploded view. And I will connect a blast node just to see this better. And I will select the inside group to be deleted. So notice how now we only have the original faces and the rest has been deleted. Now, if we select rather the inside group, or actually the outside group, sorry. Now we are only left with the new faces that were generated inside the wall. And this will become very useful when creating materials, for example, or when creating interior detail for our pieces. So I will zoom out and delete the blast node and go back to my Voronoi. So back to our pattern generation, I will select my points volume node and I will slightly increase the point separation just to have a single row of blocks just like this. And what I'm going to try to do is to offset a few of the rows to create different shapes. And for now I'm going to delete this scatter node that we won't use anymore. And below my points from volume node, I will create a point wrangler. And another thing I'm going to do is turn on this display point numbers button. You will notice how the first row of points has even numbers, the second row has odd numbers, and so on. So I will use this information to offset every other row. And to do this, I will create an if statement, and I will use a modulo operation to select only the odd numbers. So we can type if at ptnum, which is the number of each point, modulo 2 is equal to 0. Then we're going to execute the following code. v at p, which is my current position, dot x, which is referring only to the horizontal position, will be equals to v at p plus 0.2. So just make sure to close this line with a semicolon and press Control enter to evaluate. And here on the attribute definition, we need to use a small v, not a capital V. So Control enter to evaluate. So now notice if we go to our front view, how the even numbered points are offset by point 0.2. Or if we change this to point 0.1, they will be offset by this value. So let's create a channel just to be able to move this interactively. And I will open quotes. It can be single or double quotes. In this case, it doesn't make uh, a difference. I will call it offset and close quotes, then close parentheses and control enter to evaluate. Now make sure to click on this button on the right to create the actual channel that will let me offset the points. So let's go back to our perspective view. Let's turn off the display point numbers and let's click now on our Voronoi fracture. So now we have this very nice hexagonal pattern that can be generated by offsetting this rows of points by exactly half of the point separation. In this case, point 11 would create a symmetrical hexagon. So we can take a look from the front view. So press spacebar 3 and then spacebar F to frame the, the entire wall. And here we can see the patterns. Of course, if we keep increasing this offset, we can generate 
different shapes. For example, to create a floor pattern or a wall pattern. Or we could even randomize these points a bit. For example, we could add a point jitter. after our Wrangler and increase the jitter by a very small amount just to make these shapes a little bit more irregular this time let's try creating some bricks with Voronoi bricks are a very useful asset when creating destruction and they're a little bit trickier to create than one would expect. Let's create a very simple wall using the box tool. So control click on the box icon, dive into the geometry node, and let's change the parameters of the box to eight meters in X, two meters in Y, and 0.4 in Z. Let's also move the wall upward one meter. Now I will press spacebar and F to frame the view. And let's create a Voronoi just after the box. This time, instead of inputting a scatter or a volume scatter node, I will create a line pointing upward and I will make sure that the line has the same height of the box. And that can be easily done by selecting the box node, right clicking on the Y size, copying its parameter, going back to the line and copying back the parameter as a reference in the length channel. So right click on the channel and click paste relative references. So now we have a two meter line and I'm going to increase the points to let's say 10. I will connect the line to the wall. Now notice how the wall was divided horizontally in exactly 10 segments. I will just add a transform node. So I will click tab, type transform and press enter just to offset the points a little bit upward to have rows of the same height now the tricky part is how to divide all these blocks so they are offset on every other row and for that i'm going to create a for each loop so type tab and start typing for each and we're going to select for each connected piece. Let's now connect the Voronoi node to the connectivity node. And the for each will run over each of these connected pieces that were generated by the connectivity node. So if you take a look at the connectivity node, it's creating a new class attribute for each of the connected components or each of the connected primitives of this geometry. So let's make some space here. We're going to create a few more nodes inside the for each loop. And first of all, let's create a points from volume, just as we did with the last exercise with patterns. And we know this will generate a very even distribution of points. Now let's create a Voronoi fracture. Let's connect that to the for each begin and then connect it to the for each end. And I will also connect the points into the second input of the Voronoi fracture. So as we did earlier, we have now a very even distribution of cubes, one on top of another. And what we actually want is each row to be offset from the previous one. So first of all, let's increase the point separation. Let's say to 0.6. And 
then let's just click on the for each end to see how it looks and I notice here there's a few of the rows that are not being cut and this is because we don't have enough density of points going through these blocks so let me connect for example the points from volumes here to the connectivity node so we can see the amount of points that are being generated so we would need to decrease the point size or the point separation so we have at least one row of points going through the geometry or through each row of bricks so let's decrease to 0.25 the point separation let's connect it back to the for each begin and let's see what we get so this is much better now we have all of the rows being cut in squares and I will scale on X the points so we get rectangles rather than boxes so add a transform node just below the points from volume and let's increase the X scale to say 3 and this is looking much better now to create the offset between the rows we will need to use a point wrangler so press tab and type PW enter to create a point wrangler connect it after the transform node and I will give some space down here I will change the color of the point wrangler to purple or something I like press C to open the color swatch and press C again to close it and now we will need a method for the point wrangler to know which of these rows it is operating on and to do that I will click on the for each begin and you will notice here we have a button called create meta import node so click on this button this will add a new node to the right called for each begin metadata and let me call this meta just for short and if you select the node and go to the geometry spreadsheet you will notice how this node has a few attributes one of which is the iteration so this way we know in which iteration of the for each loop we're actually in so we're going to use this information to drive the point wrangler so go back to the scene view let's click on our point wrangler and let's connect this meta node to the second input to the point wrangler so I'm going to retrieve this iteration attribute to use in an if statement with, within the point wrangler so type the following if open parentheses detail open parentheses and then type one comma open quotes and type iteration close quotes type comma then zero close parentheses and then we're going to type modulo which is shift five then number two equals equals zero and close parentheses so what we're saying in this line of code is retrieve the detail attribute called iteration from the port number one in this case this meta is connected to port number one and it has a detail attribute called iteration so run this value divided by two and if the remainder of this division is equals to zero run the following code if not just ignore it and how do we know what's going to result from this division so in iteration number one one divided by two is 0.5 so the if statement will return false the second time that the iteration is run so iteration number two 
will be divided by 2 and since the remainder of 2 divided by 2 is 0 it will result in true and so on so what will happen is every even number will be offset or will be run through the if statement so let's type the following open the curly brackets then type a few spaces close curly brackets and between the curly brackets let's type v at p dot x so the position in x minus equals so subtract the following from the x position and let's create a channel so type ch open parentheses open quotes and we'll call this channel offset close parentheses actually uh, first of all close quotes close parentheses and then type semicolon and control enter to evaluate so now click here on the button to the right to create the actual offset channel and now you will notice as we increase this value only the even number of rows will be offset to the left or to the right the even columns or actually the odd rows will stay in place so they will ignore this line of code so our brick wall is looking good the only thing i want to add is probably a bevel to the edges and one more thing if you notice here on the info for the for each node you will notice how now we have the class and the name attribute the class remember was created by the connectivity node and the name was created by the voronoi so we could delete this two attributes for now we won't need them so let's lay down an attribute delete and under the primitive attributes we can delete both and finally we will add a poly bevel so if increase the distance of the bevel we will avoid these very sharp edges and here we probably want to change instead of a chamfer corner we want a round corner and maybe also increase the divisions just to have a little more detail here and finally if you want to check out the individual pieces we can add an explode view and these are the individual bricks One of the biggest disadvantages of using the Voronoi technique to fracture geometry is its very distinctive and geometric patterns. Usually the Voronoi pieces are very distinguishable and usually are very unnatural since they are almost perfectly geometrical. And they may be useful for certain applications, maybe you're doing some crystal shards or probably you're doing some abstract animations and they will be fine but in most of the cases when you're creating destruction you want to break this Voronoi look and there are several techniques that we can use to do this one of the most common and the most simple technique is the clustering technique and by clustering I mean by grouping several small pieces into larger chunks so let's create a practical exercise for now I will be using this model from Quixel Megascans. Unfortunately I will be unable to distribute the model with a file but uh, you can use any other model that you have or you can even use simple geometry. In this case I have added a switch node that can be switched into a box with the same dimensions of the wall but for practicing purposes you can use any model. Just make sure that it's a watertight model.
Okay, so let's start by adding a scatter node. So I have a null here labeled out geo, just to easily know that here we will start fracturing. And I will connect, first of all, an ISO offset to create a volume from the model. And I can increase the resolution. Let's increase it to 60. And let's scatter some points. So remember, sometimes when you are using many points or maybe when you want a more uneven result, you can turn off the relax iterations. So this will, this will give a more random distribution of points. And then I will connect a Voronoi node into the main tree. I will connect the scattered points into the second input of the Voronoi fracture. And let's click on the Voronoi fracture to make it visible. Now, the Voronoi cells have been created. I will connect an exploded view just to make it more clear. And here you can see the pieces. So we have quite a few pieces, it's fine. Uh, I think um, the computer should be able to handle this very quickly. But the problem is that if you have a closer look, we have these very sharp edges, very linear edges, that, as I mentioned before, are kind of unnatural, especially for something like concrete or brick or mortar. So let's try to break up the contours of these uh, fragments with a clustering technique. So let me zoom out a bit. And I will look for a node called RBD cluster. And I will connect this node just below the Voronoi fracture. Now notice how we have a second input called constraints. And even though we won't be generating constraints in this exercise, we will be touching on constraints in later tutorials. We will need to connect this input for the clustering workflow that I will be using. So let's click on the RBD cluster node and let's take a look at its parameters. So first of all, we have the cluster name prefix and here I want to show you, I will go into the geometry spreadsheet and into the primitives area and notice how the name has been changed to cluster. So remember, with the Voronoi node, you get an attribute called name, and the Voronoi by default uses the prefix piece. So we have P0, P1, etc. Now, when we added the RBD cluster, this name attribute has been changed to cluster and a number suffix. In this case, it also created a cluster attribute. So it's a separate attribute and the name has changed. Just keep that in mind. So I will go back to my scene view and in the RBD cluster, I'm going to click here on the cluster attribute. To the right, we have this icon that will let us visualize the clusters that are being generated. So let me connect the exploded view here to the RBD cluster node and take a look at what's happening. So notice how now we have a few very big chunks and very small pieces that they don't, they don't look very nice. They look better than what we had but let's try to fix this and try to get a nicer shape. So first of all, I'm going to look at the detach ratio. And this is what's creating the small little pieces, like the separate cells. So if I bring this value down to zero, I will only have the big clusters of pieces. So for now, let's leave this parameter at zero and let's use the cluster noise parameters to change the shape of these pieces. So first of all, if we change the size, if we increase the size, we will have 
larger pieces. If we reduce the size, we will start getting much smaller pieces. So this is starting to look very good. It's starting to look much more natural. Say, for example, that I'm happy with the size of the pieces, but maybe I want to change a few of these shapes. I could offset the pieces to get a different result. Actually, I think I'm going to go with a larger piece. I'm going to offset it a bit. Probably like this. And I want to show you now the detach parameter that we used earlier. So say I want a few smaller pieces detaching, then I could increase this ratio just to have a few. And if I'm not happy with the pieces that were created, I can always change the detach seed. By itself, the RBD clustering node can be very useful, but its main advantage resides in the fact that you can create your own clusters. Say for example that you want very specific shapes, you can create those shapes based on selections of points. Let's try that next. I will make some space below my Voronoi node and I will create a null object and connect it to the second input of the Voronoi. And just for you to see, these are the constraints that are being created by the Voronoi fracture. But for now, uh, let's ignore the constraints and let's worry about the clustering. So I will add a new point wrangler just below my node. So first of all, I will create on this arrow button to the right. This will let me make a selection of points. So make sure you have this lasso select and create an irregular selection, say on the top right corner of the wall. Then press enter to accept this selection. And now notice here under the group of points, this point wrangler will run over the selection we just created. So let's type this, I at cluster. So cluster is an attribute that Houdini will recognize and it's an integer. And this can be any number for now, I will just use one and don't forget to type semicolon. And every number that you use for the cluster will be a different piece. You can have as many clusters as you want, as long as they have different numbers. So let's try connecting this Wrangler to the second input of the RBD cluster node. And notice how now the clusters that we had have been overwritten by the ones that I've just created with a point wrangler. And notice how this cluster noise, by default, it says preserve existing cluster. So this means if there's a cluster attribute down the line, whatever clusters are being generated here in the node will be ignored. So let's try changing this to override clusters. So now it's ignoring the ones that I've just created and generating its own. Now notice we also still have on the random detach option. I will turn it off. And this way when I use the clusters I created, I will only have those two pieces. Let's try creating another corner piece. So I will copy this Wrangler. Maybe we can rename it to create cluster one. So I will copy it, paste it and connect it here on this branch. I will generate a new selection of points.
and press enter. Now I will change its name to cluster 2. Press control enter. And now I have my new piece. So as you can imagine, this will let us create very unique and customized pieces. Adding detail to your fracture geometry is essential to create a very nice look in your final render. And actually, creating interior detail for your Voronoi pieces is pretty straightforward. Let's recreate our Voronoi fracture just as a practice. So remember, once you have your geometry ready, we can create a scatter. So let's create an ISO offset volume just to have points inside the wall. Let's increase the resolution and add a scatter node. This time I will use a few pieces. Let's try with six. And then let's lay down a Voronoi fracture connected to the main tree and my scattered point into the second input. And let's add an exploded view just to see the pieces uh, more easily. So this is fine for now. Actually, I like that we have this uh, very big interior pieces so we can see the interior detail. So let's now add an RBD interior detail node. Let's connect it to our Voronoi fracture. And just in case we later want to create some rigid body dynamics, let's also connect the constraint geometry to the second input. And let's click on our RBD interior detail. Also, I will connect my exploded view to this last node. So notice how right off the bat we have a few more subdivisions here inside our Voronoi cells. I don't really like the default values in this case. Uh, probably we don't have enough detail. So first of all, let me decrease the detail size. Let's try with 0 0.075. So notice here we have more subdivisions. And for this size of pieces, I think we can even go lower. Let's try with 0 0.04. Actually, I have too much zeros. Yeah, 0 0.04. Okay, this looks nice. So here we have the noise amplitude. So let's increase it slightly until we can start seeing uh, this concave shapes. It now looks much more detailed, but I think we can still decrease the size of the noise pattern. So here we have the frequency of the noise. Of course, if we increase the frequency, we'll have smaller patterns, which in this case is what I'm looking for. Again, we have an offset. Just in case we don't like the patterns, we can change the pattern with the offset. So here I like these very nice ridges that are being created. And one other important property is the interior cusp angle. If we increase the cusp angle, we will have smoothed parts. We, if we decrease this parameter, we'll have more angled shading, just as we can see here. So let's try with 25. And this is looking nice. And there's not much more to the interior detail node. Just a few more parameters that will help you visualize how the noise is being generated. If you click here on the visualize noise scale, 
you will notice a gradient that goes from blue on the outer faces to red in the interior faces. And this is showing us the strength of the noise being applied. So notice how the noise is not being applied on the outer faces, just not to disturb the geometry or to change its outer shape. All the noise is being concentrated here on the center of the interior pieces. And usually the depth volume resolution you will need to change. The default of 50 is fine. But in case you want to push the noise outward, you can change the depth noise bias. You can increase it if you want a little bit more noise towards the exterior faces or decrease this value if you want to push the noise pattern more towards the center. So here just a word of caution. Try not to go very high with this value or even with the noise amplitude because if you go very high with these values, you may start getting some artifacts, especially here near the borders or near the edges. And this could also cause some trouble when you're creating uh, rigid body dynamics. So just be careful not to go very high with these values. We can still add a few more details in render time with uh, bump maps or displacement maps. Now that we have added some interesting detail to our interior faces, it's time to add UVs and materials to them. Let's first take a look at the actual UVs. So you can go into the viewport and press spacebar 5 to check the UV layout. And these are the UVs that came with the original model. So notice how we don't have UVs for the new faces that were generated by the Voronoi. So I will press spacebar 1 to go back to my perspective view. And if we take a look at the geometry spreadsheet and go to the primitives component, you will notice that we have three groups, the inside group, the outside group, and a group named patch, which I generated. So we can ignore this patch group for now. The inside and the outside groups were generated with the Voronoi node. So here, if you click on the Voronoi and scroll down to its properties, you will notice it is creating an interior group called inside and an exterior group called outside. So this is what we're going to use to generate our new UVs. So just remember, we already have UVs for the outside. Now we need UVs and material for the inside pieces. So let's go down to our RBD interior detail and add a UV on wrap node. I will connect it to the main tree and click on its visibility. So let's go back to the scene view and press spacebar 5. So notice how UVs have been created for every single phase. So let's go onto the group property and check the inside group. This way, we're only generating these new UVs for the interior phases that were created. So first of all, let me shift the UVs to a new UV space. So we can also add a UV transform node. and shift them in X by one unit. Again, make sure to select the inside group. So by default, we have a very nice layout. Let's just decrease the spacing here. Maybe we don't need this much padding. So go back to your unwrap and change the spacing to 0.5. Probably we could even go lower to, let's go to 0.25. So let's go back to our perspective with spacebar one. Let's connect our exploded view just below our UV transform. 
and notice now we have some textures here for now we have the same material that we're using for the exterior faces but let's try adding a new material and if I go to the material context you'll notice I have two materials created one is for the broken wall and the other one is for the interior concrete so again remember I will not be able to distribute these materials because these materials were downloaded from mega scans as well but you can create your own materials and use your own textures for this purpose so I will go back to the object context inside my geometry node and below the UV transform I will connect a material node so select the node again make sure to select the interior faces or the inside group and select the new material that was created in this case I will select the old concrete and connect my exploded view so here we are with a new interior material and I think it's looking quite nice the Voronoi fracture is great for fracturing objects such as glass, concrete or even rock but when it comes to fracturing wood it's a little bit more trickier than it seems I will now show you a technique that will help you create realistic wood splinters in a simple way so here I have another Megascans model again I've added a switch node where I can switch between the model and a box and for now I will use the 3D model although for this exercise you could use a simple box so below the out geo node remember this is just the geometry and I will create all the pieces below this node I will add a transform node and I will scale this geometry in its Y axis so let me change the color of the node I will also change its name to transform Y and let's change the scale on Y to 0.2 now to create the points for the Voronoi node I will add a grid and I will change the scale to 0.5 I will template the node just to be able to see it and I will scatter onto it a few points let's say 20 points actually let's go higher to 5 400 points okay that's fine now let's add a point jitter and change the jitter scales I will change the x-axis to 0 as well as the z-axis and change the y-axis to let's say point, point 0.1 is fine okay now that we have our points let's add a Voronoi fracture and connect the points to the second input as usual so notice how now we have this fracture geometry and we will revert it to its original transform by copying this transform node pasting it after the Voronoi fracture I will connect it here and here is a very useful property on the transform node if you scroll all the way down you will notice there is an option called invert transformation so let's click on this property and notice how now we have the wood plank back to its original scale so 
let me connect an exploded view and connect it to the second transform and notice how now we have this very long splinter like shapes that are very difficult to generate with the Voronoi fracture alone Now that we've gone through the fundamentals of Voronoi fracturing, we will explore a very powerful tool, Boolean. The main advantage of the Boolean tools is that they will allow you to create very specific and very art directable cuts and fractures for your destruction effects. First of all, let's take a look at the geometry that I will be using for this exercise. I have downloaded the huge Icelandic volcanic cliff from Megascans but you can use any other similar geometry that you wish. So let's dive into the geometry node and see what I have done. So if you look at the tree, you will notice that I have loaded the file. Then I have rescaled it just a little bit so I don't have a huge model. So if you go into the information icon in a node, you will see a few very uh, useful parameters. In this case, you can see the size of the geometry. So it has 156 meters in length, which is fine for this kind of models. So additionally, I extruded a few faces, just a tiny bit, and then I pulled them downward, just so they lay flat on the ground and I added a polyfill. So remember that usually for fracturing and especially for booleans you want to make sure that you have a watertight geometry. In this case the polyfill will ensure that all the open edges are closed. Now that my main geometry is prepared I will generate a second geometry that will let me carve into the mountain to create some fragments. So let's create a sphere and let's make sure it's quite large. So I will scale it to 20 meters in diameter. So I have one meter in radius and a uniform scale of 10. Now I will template the cliff geometry, select the sphere and add a transform. And I will use this transform to place it just on the ledge of the rock so I can cut through it with the boolean tool. So you can press T and then move the sphere upward. Probably in this case a bit to the right. And I will also squash it with the transform, with the scale transform. So I'll make it bigger on the x axis, also on the y axis. And probably I will flatten it a bit on the c axis. Now, one very important thing when using Booleans is that both geometries have to be polygonal surfaces. So let's make sure that the sphere is rather than a primitive, a polygon. And let's increase the frequency to 20, just to have enough detail. Now, another thing that I want to do is to add some detail to this surface. We could probably use a mountain node. and we could increase the detail size. So select the mountain node. Probably increase the element size to about six or seven meters. Also increase the height to about five meters. And just make sure to place the sphere where it looks interesting. In this case, I want to grab 
the top of the cliff and probably carve into it just a little bit not that much but again this is a matter of choice and you could place the cutting geometry in a very precise place so I think I will stick with this for now and continue to boolean the geometry so I will press the tab key and type B O O L to find the boolean node place it just below the cliff geometry and then connect the second input to the sphere now make sure to click on the boolean visibility icon and let's talk about the boolean options so first of all very important take a look at set a that would be whatever geometry is coming in the first input the default is set to treat as solid object and this is fine for now because the cliff is a closed geometry and I want it to be treated as a solid. Same for the sphere. The sphere is a closed mesh and it should be a solid mesh. So set B, which is coming from input 2, is also being treated as a solid. Now most importantly we have the operation. This will determine the result of the boolean. So by default we have the intersection and if you notice here on the viewport you'll see how all the cliff has been deleted and we only have the part that was intersecting with the sphere and this can be very useful. Let me add a null node just so we can see better this result. Let me untemplate the cliff. And here is a result of the boolean. So by itself, this is very interesting because this can be further fractured to create, for example, an avalanche or an explosion or whatever destruction we want to create. So let's leave this as rock geometry. And I will copy the boolean node with control C and control V. Make sure you have selected the boolean too. And this time I will change the operation to subtract. So by default it will subtract A minus B. In this case that's fine because we want to detach the sphere from the cliff and if you take a look at both parts we have the positive and the negative we have the cliff and the piece of the rock that we will crumble or we will destroy so let's add another null and let's call this null cliff geometry Now we could add a normal node just to fix this black normals that we have here on the cliff. And apparently we had the same problem with the sphere. So I will also add the normal to my sphere geometry. So let me cut this with Control X and paste it with Control V just above the null and again copy and paste and this will fix this strange normals that were created after the boolean so normally after the boolean operation you will have to add a normal just to fix this kind of problems that will arise so by itself this is looking very interesting we have both parts of the geometry prepared to create our destruction now notice something very important here the resulting geometry that was generated from the boolean has no uvs and this is something that you will normally want to fix so let us go back to the sphere geometry and before we even boolean the cliff 
let's add a UV texture node just below the sphere. So let's take a look at the sphere now. So probably for this kind of geometry, you could use either um, polar or I think even a planar projection could work. So let's try with orthographic. Just make sure in this case to project from the C axis. So I would change the projection axis to C. And I think this could help. So if we go back to the Boolean, I think this may work. Let's try selecting the cliff. And you will notice how the UVs from the sphere are being also inherited by this new geometry on the cliff, which is very handy. So one final advice when you're fracturing with Boolean, and I will go back to Boolean number one just to show you. Uh, here below the parameters, we have a few output primitive groups. So usually I turn on B inside A, and let me show you real quick what this is doing. So I will create a blast node click on the visibility icon for the blast and under the group I will select this B inside A group that I just created. So notice how I'm deleting this new faces that were created inside the rock. So if I delete non-selected you will notice how all these new faces are being grouped with this name B inside A and this can be very useful afterwards if maybe we want to change the texture or probably we only want to change the UVs in this area or even when we later want to generate debris or particles or maybe some fluids from the broken piece. So I will delete the blast node And I will save this file so I can later use both pieces separately. Now that we understand how the Boolean tool works, let's try shattering this rock further to prepare it for destruction. So first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to center this piece of rock to the grid. So I will add a transform node. And here's a handy trick. I will type in all three axes, minus dollar sign CEX, which is the value of the centroid of the object. Then for the Y axis, I will type minus dollar sign CEY. Same for the Z axis. I'll type minus dollar sign CEY. Z and enter. Now notice how the rock is centered on the grid and this will make my explanation much easier. This step is not mandatory but I think it will help us in this case. So first of all I will create a grid and I'm going to use this grid object to cut through the rock. Now let's template the rock, select the grid, and make the grid a bit larger, say 30 meters. Let's also increase its subdivisions. Let's try with 40 and 40. And I'm going to add some noise. I can use a mountain node just to make it a little more irregular I will increase the height and probably increase the size as well something like this is fine now remember in our earlier chapter how the boolean sub will create 
new geometry and will inherit the UVs from the objects we're using to create the Boolean. So before we go much further, I will add a UV texture node and create an orthographic projection along the, the Y axis. So the defaults are fine. If you want to check the UVs that we just generated, you can go to the perspective and press spacebar 5. And here we have our UVs. So I will now press spacebar 1 to go back to the perspective view. And I'm going to transform the grid so it goes through the rock in a more vertical way. So I'll press enter and I will rotate it a bit. I think something like this is fine. I will cut it in half. And now I'll go back to my rock object and add a boolean node. And I will connect the grid to the second input of the boolean. Now remember by default this node assumes that we have two solid and that we want an intersection of both. So in this case my first input or set A is a solid so this is fine but my second input which is set B is not a solid object. In this case we need to treat this object as a surface. Now the second thing that I have to do is change the operation to intersect, sorry, to shatter. So apparently nothing has happened, although we see here a green line. The model seems just the same as before. So let's try adding an exploded view just to see what happens. So now you will notice that we have the two pieces of rock and they were cut exactly where the plane is. And even we have some interior detail from the mountain sub that we used on the plane. And there's something very important that I usually do, especially when I'm doing destruction. And this I also explained in the previous chapter, but it's very important. So I will repeat it here. I will select my boolean node, scroll down to where the group properties are and make sure to tick B inside A. So this will create a group of the new faces that were created where the plane was intersecting the rock. And as we did before, I'm going to add a blast node just to show you which is the group that we just created. So select B inside A and delete non-selected. And actually I'm going to connect it here below the, the exploded view. So here are the new faces. These are the exterior faces that, that existed before the Boolean. So we will be using the B inside A group, for example, to add uh, normals back to the faces or again to change the UVs, probably change the material. So let's go back to my boolean node and next I want to show you a very interesting technique. I will go back to my plane object, make sure to click on it and before I pipe it into the boolean I'm going to duplicate this plane. I'm going to add a transform and actually I will do this just before the vertical transformation I added. So I'm going to move it upward just a bit and merge it with my original plane. So you can press Y and drag on a connection just to break it. And I will again merge the original plane with a new transformed plane. So right now there's nothing interesting, they're just parallel one to each other. 
But what I want to do is to change the noise values or the mountain values that I added. So actually I'm going to also duplicate the mountain before I merge them together. And each plane will have its own height and offset. So let's increase a bit the height for this one. And let's offset in Y. Probably translate it less. Let's write it with 0.3. Probably 0.4. And you will notice how these two planes start to intersect. So I'll press spacebar W to go into wireframe. And you will notice how some of the parts from the bottom plane are intersecting over the top plane. And this will create some interesting effects once we've booleaned the rock. So let's try decreasing the element size a bit. Let's try with 1.5. And probably I will also decrease the height. So you can select both nodes at the same time to change one value for both of them. So let's try also decreasing the size and the height. Just make sure they keep intersecting. So again, let's lower the distance to 0.2. Now I will connect it back to the original transform. And let's see how the boolean looks. So notice how we now have some interior pieces, not only the two halves. We have also some small pieces and some medium pieces which will give a very interesting look to the destruction. So probably we don't want this huge middle piece. I'm going to try to break it up. But in general, what I'm looking for is small pieces and medium pieces that will give much more detail to my destruction. So just to avoid this very large piece, I'm going to increase the mountain height and see if we can break it up a little bit more. So probably I went too far. I'll bring it back to three. And try reducing the transform height instead. So here it's just a matter of testing your values. So I think I will leave this up to you. But in general, what we're looking for is this breakup. OK, I'm back after pausing the video for a few minutes. I kept testing a bit with the mountain parameters. And in the end, I decided to create two more copies and this did the trick so now i have much more separated pieces and if you check the exploded view you'll notice how we don't have like this large pieces connected together so i will go with this and before we move ahead i will show you a very nice trick with these intersected planes before we move on the rbd material fracture workflow I want to show you how to add more detail with our current setup. So first of all, I'm going to zoom into the main tree and disconnect the Boolean node. Actually, I'm also going to delete this last transform and I'm going to keep my planes. I will go back to my huge rock and before I move on, I will remove this H script variables that I added here. I can Control shift and click on the translate property and I'm doing this because 
later I will copy this transform and invert it just to bring back the rock into its original place and with the uh, hrip variables this won't work we will look into this later for now I will add an iso offset node just to convert the geometry into a volume and increase the resolution a bit and then I will add a scatter node to scatter some points into this volume so first of all I'm going to turn off relax iterations and I'm going to start with just a few points let's try with six points and before I copy these planes onto the points I'm going to add an attribute randomize node and randomize the n attribute of the points which is the normal of the points and remember this will orient the grid objects once we copy them into the points so I'm going to click on this button called display normals and let's try to see the normals on this point so what I'm going to do with the attribute randomize is change the uniform continuous parameter for the inside sphere parameter so this will orient all these points in random directions within an entire sphere so let's try this I will add a copy to points node connect these points into the second input and I will connect my planes into the first input of the node so now we have six planes intersecting and let's try to boolean the rock with these new planes so I will connect back my rock to my boolean and then connect the planes to the boolean node now this may take a while we will be generating a lot of new geometry so depending on your system you may want to start with very few points and then increase the number of points depending on the amount of pieces that you want for your simulation or for your destruction or the amount of detail that you want to get so let's take a look at the exploded view so now we have a lot of pieces let me turn off the display normals I think this is starting to look fine let's not forget to add a normal node just to get rid of those black faces and I will only apply new normals to the B inside A group so let's connect it back to our exploded view and notice where we have rocks breaking we will have a lot of detail inside which in general is very natural so one very nice thing about the shatter technique is that we don't get this cell pattern look that we usually get with a Voronoi fracture so that's one advantage the downside may be that sometimes boolean can be a little bit picky with a geometry but in general each technique will have its own use and its own applications in this case I really like this very sharp shards that will be created in the rims of the breaking rock I will try increasing the pieces a bit and then we can create a test simulation so I will go back to my scatter node and I will double the amount of points or actually I'll just increase it to 10 and see what I get now I may need to pause the video depending on how long it takes but I will show you the result in a few minutes actually it didn't take that long it only took about a minute to finish so probably at this point it would be a good idea to save the geometry 
what I usually like to do is to output my fracture geometry with a ROP node. So let's go back to our main tree. For now, I will disconnect the exploded view and I will create a null node. Call this out fracture or fractured rock. I will change the node to black and let's not forget to bring back the pieces to their original place. So I will copy the original transform that I used to offset the pieces and I can call this offset to center. I will copy the node paste it just before our null and I will invert the transformation so click here on the invert transformation and it should now be back in its place so just let's make sure if you go back to our previous null here it is in its original place and down here we should have it exactly on the same place so now the difference is we have a few pieces or actually a lot of pieces that have been fractured with a shatter boolean okay so to save the geometry i will add a rop output geometry node and i will name this node fractured rock I will use the default name and folder location and click on save to disk now I will add a file node just to read back in this geometry so I usually like to paint them with a blue color and what you could do is select your ROP geometry output, copy the output file location, and paste it in the geometry file in your file node. So I will paste as a relative reference. So here I have my saved geometry. And let's real quick create a very basic simulation. So with a node selected, go to the rigid bodies tab and control click on the rbd fractured object make sure to click on the rbd packed object and again we will create a very basic simulation just for testing so i will go with the defaults for now i will also add a ground plane so go to the collisions tab and control click on a ground plane and I will create a flipbook just to take a look at what we have so far. So this simulation may take a while. Again, I will pause the video and I will come back when the flipbook is done. Okay, so this is what we have so far. Notice how where the rock is breaking, we have a lot of very tiny details and not only small pieces, but we also have some medium chunks and this gives a very nice richness to the texture and to the detail that we're getting when the rock breaks. And remember, this is a very simple RBD setup. And although we will be touching in more complex RBD setups in future tutorials, I would always recommend you to try at least with a simple basic setup uh, just to see how the breaking and how the fracturing is looking. So let me play this again. So far I'm very happy with the results and of course if you want to add some more pieces and keep experimenting with the, with the size of the mountain or the amount of planes I would encourage you to do it. We will now take a look at the RBD Material Fracture node, which is one of the latest additions in Houdini's destruction workflow.
So as you may know by now, I like to start with a very simple exercise just to understand the principles and then we will jump into our main destruction scene to build up on our new acquired knowledge. Let's start by creating a simple box. So control click on the box tool, dive into the geometry node and let's change some of the box parameters. For example, the size to six on X, two meters on Y and 0.4 on Z. Let's also recenter the object one meter above the ground. Just to have a basic wall to work with. Now, as usual, we will create a volume from this polygon. So I will lay down an ISO offset node. Remember, you can also use a convert VDV node. For this case, uh, this is fine. I will use a uniform sampling division of 60. Then I will scatter some points. And make sure we have less points. Probably 10 for now is fine. I may change the seed as well. Now I will look for an RBD material fracture node and connect the wall to this node. I will also connect the scattered points to the fourth input of the RBD material fracture node. So you will notice that now we have a few pieces generated. And as usual, let's add our exploded view. Connect the first input or the first output of the RBD material fracture node to the exploded view. And let's reduce a bit the uniform scale to 0.2. Right out of the bat, we have a few cells that look a little bit like the Voronoi cells that we created with the Voronoi fracture node. But in general, the RBD material fracture node is much more powerful. So let's take a look at some of the parameters. I will select the node. And the first thing you'll notice is that we have a material type. And by default, it's set to concrete. So let's first of all explore the concrete parameters. And then we will take a look at the glass and wood. A small note before we continue. It doesn't really make a difference for now if we have this fourth input connected. So actually I'm going to press Y and drag just to disconnect the scattered points. So notice how the cells haven't changed. Let's take a look at the parameters without this connection. And then I will explain how this connection works. So notice how by default we have a fracture level two on. This tab has some parameters for fracture level two. For now, I will delete this level and add it back later on. So click here on the remove icon and I will just work with one level for now. So I will scroll down a bit and notice how first of all, and probably the main option that you want to check first is the scatter points is set to five. If I increase this scatter point, say to 20, I will have more pieces, just like as in the Voronoi fracture node. I can also change the seed if I'm not happy with the arrangement of the pieces. And notice how we have a scatter from a volume or an attribute. To use the attribute option, you need to have a density parameter on your geometry. But for now, we will work with this default volume option. And this is doing something similar that we're doing here with our ISO offset or with the create VDV from polygons node. So first of all, it generates a volume. And here we have some options for that volume. And then it scatters a few seeds to create the Voronoi cells. So the main parameters on the fog volumes are the resolution. In this case, 75 is usually fine. If you increase this value, you will have a higher resolution volume 
but a slower result. You can also increase the frequency and of course as usual you can offset the pattern to achieve a different cell distribution and the main objective of this uh, volume noise is to have a fairly uneven distribution of points to avoid even sized cells which usually uh, looks unnatural let's go back to the cell points and remember we had a fourth connection on the rbd material fracture let's connect back the scatter points that we had previously and notice nothing new has happened so by default the rbd material fracture uses its own internal points to create the cells if we reduce the scatter points to zero we now have our original wall back to where we started we could click on the input points to create our voronoi cells so if you select the scatter node and change for example the count or even the seed you will notice that now the rbd material fracture node is using the scattered points to generate the cells so let's again reduce the number of points say to 20 and go back to the material fracture node and let's take a look into a few of the other parameters so I will click on the chipping tab and click on the enable chipping option so notice how a few new cells were generated on the borders or actually on the corners of these big cells and this is nice to add more detail so you could change the overall ratio parameter to increase the number of chipped fragments. So basically, the larger this number is, the more chips you'll have. Or you could also reduce this number. And of course, as usual, you can change the seed to change the distribution of these new cells. So for now, I'm going to turn off this option. And here we have a very interesting option, which is the detail. So click on the detail tab. And here you have two options, the edge detail and the interior detail. So first of all, let's start with the edge detail. I will turn this on. And notice how, first of all, the interior faces have been subdivided. So now we have much more points and primitives on the inside geometry and this is controlled by the detail size. So for now I will increase this a bit to 0.1 and the lower this number is the smaller these triangles will be. Another very important parameter is the noise height. So the larger this value is the larger will be the angles that are generated here on the edges. And this parameter is very important to avoid the geometric cells that are usually generated by the Voronoi fracture. So if you take a look at the edges now, they look much more natural and look much more like a concrete or a rock material. So the noise element size can change the detail in this pattern so the smaller this value is the smaller the detail will be of course if you have very large chunks you might want to increase this value for now i will go to noise height of 0.15 and noise element size of 0.2 so this is looking very nice of course we could increase the detail but I will go with this for now. Now let's take a look at the all important interior detail. So I will click here on the interior detail option and you will immediately notice that some detail was generated on the interior faces. So let me just click outside of the note to be able to see the detail here. 
I will also zoom in. And the parameters here are very similar to the edge detail. We have a noise amplitude, which will increase the height of the noise. So this by itself is looking very, very interesting. We can also change the frequency of this noise. So if I increase the overall frequency, I will have smaller patterns. In this case, I probably would have to increase the resolution of the interior faces. Let's try increasing to 0 0.05. Actually, I will go lower for now to 0 0.025. Of course, this will be slower, but we will have much more detail on the edges or actually on the interior faces. So let's reduce the frequency just a bit. I will also reduce the noise amplitude. And this will greatly increase the detail in your fractured pieces. And now if you're wondering if this is probably too much detail on your geometry, one of the most interesting features of the RBD material fracture node is it's generating a low resolution mesh based on the original Voronoi cells that are generated. So let's lay down a null object and let's connect the third input or actually the third output of this node which is called proxy geometry to this null. So if I click on the visibility for this null, you will notice that we have the original low resolution cells that were created before adding the detail. So let's connect this to the exploded view. So in the end, when we are creating our RBD simulations, we could use the low resolution version of this fracture object and then switch to the high resolution version for rendering, which is a very powerful workflow. Let's now take a look at the secondary fracture levels of the RBD material fracture node. So I will go back to the primary fracture tab. And if you remember, I previously deleted a fracture level two tab that's there by default. So to create it again, I will click on this plus icon and we will have now a fracture two level. So I will click on the tab here just to see its parameters. And for now, I will turn off the edge detail and the interior detail options just to make this faster. And I will go back to my primary fracture tab make sure we're on level two. So the parameters in level two will be exactly the same that in level one. The main difference is that level two will be applied recursively on the pieces that were generated in level one. So what does it mean? Let me reduce the fracture ratio, say to 0.2 and zoom out a bit. And you will notice for now, this looks very similar to what we had with only one level. So if I increase the ratio a bit, say to 0.6, you will notice now that some of the cells that were generated previously are now being broken again into several more pieces. And this is dependent on the scatter points value that we have here. So let me reduce this to three points and now each one of these cells that were broken again have three pieces instead of just one so let's increase this to 10 for example and now we will have more detail so let's try now increasing the fracture ratio to 0.9 again and now only some of the large pieces will be left unbroken. So this secondary or even tertiary fracture levels can help us add detail and to break the uneven sized pieces that usually give away the Voronoi look. 
Now, a very important thing that you must keep in mind is that the RBD material fracture node is generating some groups for the geometry. So let me connect a blast node just below my exploded view. And if you go to the group area, you will notice that besides the pieces that have been generated, we have an inside group, which are only the inside faces that were created. Let me click on the delete non-selected. So these are the inside faces that were created for the Voronoi cells. We have also an outside group which are our original faces. And beside those groups, we have a concrete fracture inside that were the first pieces that were created. And also a fracture two inside group. And these are the fracture level two pieces that were created. So these groups will become very important when we start creating our destruction. Probably we will use some of these groups to generate particles or probably to generate some volumes and increase the detail on our destruction. So I will delete the blast node. And I want to show you one last feature that will be very important also when generating RBD simulations. And it is this second output of the node. So I will connect the node to the second output. And you will notice we have a few connections and these connections are constraints that can be used further down the line to create our destruction. And although we won't be touching on constraint on these tutorials, we will be looking into constraints in detail in future tutorials. So just for you to know, remember that this second output and the second input of the node is used to generate this constraint. We will now look into creating glass with the RBD material fracture node. Although creating glass is a relatively straightforward process, it is very tricky to create nice glass fracturing without this node. So usually the RBD material fracture node is my first choice when I need to fracture glass. So let's take a look at how this works. I have a very simple box ready with a transparent material just to make it look interesting. And I will lay down a new RBT material fracture node and I will connect it to the box. So remember by default we have the concrete material type on and first of all, I will change this to glass. And by default, we have one single scatter point. So if you go to the impact points, scatter points, by default, there's only one. So of course, we could increase this to two, three or more points. The thing with glass is that you usually want to have a very precise positioning of your impacts. So for now, I will turn off the scatter points. And just as we did with concrete on the last video, I will add some points as seeds for the fracturing. So let me click the tab key and type add. And I will turn on one point or point number zero make sure to select the add node go to the perspective and press enter just to be able to move around the point in space so i will position it just where i want the fracture to be and i will connect this node to the fourth input of the rbd material fracture node so make sure now to select the rbd material fracture node and click on the input points to use this new created point as a seat for the impact. And of course, if we eventually want to add more points, we can go back to the add node, click on the plus icon up here, turn on point one, and again, we can move it around to position it exactly where we want it to be.
so I will turn off point one for now. I'll just keep point zero. And let's select the RBD material fractional to take a look at its properties. So first of all, I'm going to click on the cracks tab. And this is where we'll find the main properties for the glass fracturing. So first of all, the radial crack number is probably one of the main features that we'll notice when looking at fracturing glass. So it is this radial lines that go from the center of impact outward. So let me increase the radial crack number to say 40. So now we have a much more detailed fracture. Now you can increase the number variance to make it look a little more irregular. So usually the higher this number, the more irregular the cracks will be. If I set this to zero, for example, we will have a more regular number of cracks. So let's bring it back to, let's say, eight. Now the concentric crack is the distance that we'll get from the center of the impact point outward in terms of this breaking. So let me increase this number to let's say 0.2. So now we have much less of these uh, cuts, these radial cuts. And if we decrease this value, of course we will have much more cuts and with a much less spacing. So I will leave it like this for now just for us to better see the discontinuity frequency. So this is a little bit like a noise pattern. If I increase this value, the patterns will tend to be smaller. And if we decrease this value, the patterns will tend to be larger. A little bit like the noise patterns. So again, we can decrease this size or increase it to make these gaps larger. So let me increase the width a little bit. Let's go with this for now. And now let's take a look into the chipping. Uh, in my opinion, chipping, you should always use this value. So I will click here on Enable Chipping. And you'll notice that some of these very large shards will start breaking up to make it even more irregular. So Usually we have the ratio. If we increase the ratio, more of the shards will break apart, which I really like. Of course, you can change the seed just to change the distribution of these cuts. And by changing the corner ratio, you can also increase these cuts more towards the corners of the object. So if we reduce this value, you will notice how we have less cuts on the corners. So I will increase it. I really like how these cuts look. And let's go now to the detail, which is also a very important parameter. So if you take a look at the front view, I'll, I'll press spacebar three, just to look these cuts from the front. They're kind of soft and kind of regular throughout the length. If we turn off the edge noise, they're perfectly linear, which is very unnatural. So what I usually would recommend is turn this value on and play with the size. So in this case, I think the size is quite large. I will try to uh, decrease the size of the detail, probably to half, and increase the noise amplitude, let's say twice as much. And we could increase the noise frequency just to make this noise much smaller. So I think I overdid it with the noise amplitude. So I think this is starting to look much better. And another very important thing that we need to remember is that the RVD material fracture is generating for free the low resolution version of this geometry and a constraint network in case we need to do some destruction later. So let me add a null object just below the RBD node and connect the third output of the node to the null. 
So right now we're taking a look at the low resolution geometry. So especially if you take a look at the edges, notice how this is much lower resolution than the first input where we have more subdivisions and more jagged edges. And again, we will talk about simulating in later tutorials. Just have in mind that whenever you use the new RVD material fracture workflow, we have this information for free. So let's take a look at the constraint network. And of course, if we take a look at the groups that have been generated for the geometry, we will have several groups created that can later be very useful to generate particles or additional detail like materials or even displacement. So let's very quickly add a blast node just to take a look at the groups that were created. Click on Delete Non-Selected and select the group that you want to check. So in this case, we're only seeing the inside edges of the shift glass. We can also take a look at the concentric inside pieces, which can be very useful. And in general, the glass shattering has a lot of groups that will be created just in case we need them later. We will now take a look at the RBD material fracture node to create wood splinters and wood fracturing. For this exercise, I will be using this 3D model from Megascans, but remember, since I cannot distribute the models with the files, you can use a simple geometry or whatever 3D model that you have. So first of all, I will dive into the geometry node, and just below this node, I will connect an RBD material fracture Make sure to click on its visibility icon. And remember by default, the material type is set to concrete. So before we change this, let's add an exploded view as usual, just to better see the pieces that will be generated. So of course, in this case, the concrete won't work for us. So let's change that first. In the material type, change the type to wood. And right off the bat, you'll notice that we have some nice splinters here. Of course, we can do better than this, but as we've seen earlier, to achieve this kind of splinters with the regular tools is not that straightforward. So let us go into the grain parameters. And probably here, the easiest way to explain how the wood works is changing the visualizing parameters. I'm going to look for the Guide Geometry option and turn on Grains, which is what we're actually changing here. So you will notice that the grains will be created with a few intersecting planes and Boolean operations, just as we did in Chapter 3. Now, the grain spacing is exactly the space that we have here between each of these planes. So if we increase this value, we'll have a much larger separation here. So in this case, we only have two planes. If we want much more detail, we could decrease this value. So now we will have much more cutting planes. So let me go back to the default. You can control and middle click on a parameter to set it back to the default value. Now the grain offset is a random offset that we will have between each plane. So the bigger this value is, the greater this random spacing will be. And of course we have a seed value. If we don't like the distribution that we get, we can always change this number. Now the grain noise is this noise that we get on each plane. So if we increase the height, we will increase this noise something similar to what we did with the mountains up. So let's reduce this a bit. 
and you can also increase or decrease the element size. In this case, I will decrease it just a bit. So we have smaller mountains. And the grain detail size is basically the resolution in which each of these planes will be subdivided. So in general, the closer you're going to look into the object, the more detail you want. And if you have, for example, a very distant shot, or you don't need an extremely high resolution model, you can always increase this value. So let's take a look at the exploded view. And notice how, although we were cutting here with a few planes, we are not getting this separation or these pieces separated. And the reason why this is happening is that by default the wood object is clustering the pieces so let me click on the cluster tab and you will notice that by default the enable cluster is on so for now let me turn this off just to see the individual pieces and here we can clearly see the cutting planes that we were using to generate these pieces Let's now take a look into the cut parameters of the wood object. So first of all, let me turn off the exploded view. I will zoom into the object a bit and I will change the guide geometry to cuts. So the cuts are also planes that will generate shatter cuts, but this time through the length of the object. And for now, let me go down into the splinters parameters and take the splinter length to zero. And I will go back to the exploded view. So notice when combined, the grains and the cut generate plenty of detail. So let me click on the node again, just to be able to change a few of these parameters. I will go back to the grain and turn off grain for now. So here we only have the cuts. This will help me see more clearly these parameters. So the spacing, of course, it's the space between each of these planes. The larger the spacing is, the less planes we'll have. And thus the pieces will also be longer. Again, we have a cut offset and this is a random distance between each plane. So again, if we increase this value, we will have larger random values between each plane. So this way we will have more uneven lengths of cuts. So if we bring this down to zero, most of these pieces will have the same length. I usually like to increase this value a lot. And let me again go back to my visualizers. If I increase the curve noise, I'm increasing the amplitude of this noise. And if I want to make the noise pattern smaller, I can decrease the element size. Now, if you notice, we have no splinters anymore. We just have these chunks of wood. The splinters are generated with this value, the splinter length which is basically a very extreme noise that is applied to this cutting planes. So these sharp splinters are being generated with this very high value of splinter length. So let me take again a look at the cutting planes and change my visualizers to splinters. So here you see the planes that are generating these splinters. If we decrease the splinter length value, you will notice the splinters will be much, much smaller. And the splinter density is the amount of splinters that will be generated. Usually we want a large amount of splinters, but it really depends on the size of the wood you're cutting. So just be careful if you increase this value a lot, you can end up with a lot of detail. So let's try adding a little bit more length. Let's take a look at the exploded view. And again, here the values that you use will greatly depend on the look that you're wanting to achieve. 
Other than this, there's not much to the wood object. Just remember that, as usual, we will be generating a few groups. You will have the inside polygons, and you will also have a wood cut inside and a wood cut outside group, just in case you want to add UVs or generate particles in your simulation. Now that we are proficient with most of the fracturing techniques, let's start creating some serious destruction. Throughout the total destruction series, we will be creating this shot from scratch. The idea is to create some fire, smoke, explosions, and to even make this building collapse, and have a finalized shot that you can create and customize for your own demo reel. I will be covering the layout, texturing and lighting on a separate free video that you can also find through CG Circuit. And on following tutorials, we will start handling the fire, the rigid body dynamics, particles and fluids. For now, we will start fracturing the building on the left that we will later collapse with a huge explosion. So let's get started. I will switch into a new scene where I have laid down a basic building and I did this with the Dan building node. This digital asset will also be provided with the files and it can be used freely in personal or professional projects. Now, before we start just randomly cutting and fracturing, it's very important to have a very clear idea of what's going to happen in your shot. So first of all, let me show you some reference that I gathered before I even started this project. First of all, let me show you a building collapse created by Main Road Post for the film Stalingrad. This is a very nice example of a building collapsing. It has a lot of elements that I really like. For example, the initial explosion, which creates a lot of smoke and debris, looks very nice. And after that, the building starts falling apart and you can clearly see some large pieces and also some small scale debris and wood that really sells the shot. So of course, at some point, there's some artistic freedom that you can take, but it's very, very important that you have a very clear idea of what's going to happen in your shot. And not only that, but also the final composition that, will, that your shot will have and where the camera will be placed. So let me take a look at some pictures. Most of these pictures are from World War II. I really liked in these two pictures the idea of having a tank and probably in my shot we were going to have some shells exploding near the tank before the building collapses. But take a look at the level of detail that we have in the destroyed parts of the building. And usually we also see a lot of debris in the ground. Broken wood, broken concrete, bricks, rebar and iron. So all of these details we'll try to include. Of course, depending on the time that we have, but the more detail you can add, the better. So let's go back to our scene. And let me show you the camera that we have. So this is a camera I created on the layout process. So this is very important because the angle of the camera and how close or how far we are from the building will give you the cue of where to fracture, where to add more detail and how to create the cuts to control the collapsing of the building. So let me dive back into the geometry node and let me show you what I have in mind. I will create an explosion here and I will have some debris flying more or less towards the right of the screen and after this big explosion the building will start colliding downward. So a few more things that I want to prepare are a few frags and fissures here on the columns more or less like this. This will allow the building to collapse freely in a vertical direction so I would need to make sure that the fissures go all the way back to the building. 
and of course I will need a lot of detail for the debris coming from the explosion. So with this in mind I will start creating some very localized fractures and pieces to achieve an interesting result. Now that we have a clear idea of how the destruction will take place, I will start scattering some points to create Voronoi fractures, or in this case I will use the RBD material fracture node to generate some nice detail to the pieces. So first of all, I will lay down a VDB from Polygon's node. So I will convert the entire building to a density volume. So remember the density volume can be used to scatter points inside the geometry. For now I will use the default resolution and let's lay down the scatter node. Now here's an important note. Usually when I'm doing destruction I would turn off the relax iterations option just to make the distribution of the points more uneven. In this case I will keep it on. The first pass of Voronoi cells that I want is just a generic breakup of the building, so very regular and big chunks that later I will break down into smaller pieces. So let's see what we get with this setting. I will lay down an RBD material fracture node. I will connect my building to the first input, the points to the fourth input, and let's click on the RBD material fracture node. So one of the first things we want to do is turn off the fracture level 2. So I will click on this tab and then click on the remove icon. And another thing I want to do is turn off the scatter points altogether because remember we will be using our own scattered points. So I need to click on the input points to be able to use this fourth input. Now just an advice here depending on the amount of pieces that you will be generating and the hardware you're using this complex fractures may take a while to calculate. So at some point you may want to turn on the manual update and after creating your setup just clicking on the update button here to the left to see the results. So for now I will turn the auto update on but maybe later on I will need to turn on the manual update just to be able to work faster. Another very important thing to consider is that at the end of the process I will add some detail not only to the edges but also to the interior pieces. So I usually try to set this up first before starting to generate a great amount of pieces. Then I would turn this additional detail off just before I start simulating. So let's see how this looks. I will add an exploded view connected to my RBD material fracture node. And let's go back to the node and look for the detail options. So I know I won't be using a very small size. I'll probably increase it to 0.15. Also for now just to make it faster. Turn on the edge detail. And as I mentioned earlier, this process will start to take more time. So in this case, it took a few seconds to generate this interior detail. But the more pieces we have, and the smaller the detail size we have, the longer it will take. So let's try to nail the detail before we start creating more pieces. And then we can come back and turn it on when we're ready to simulate or to render. So in this case I want a little bit more jacked edges, so I will increase the noise height probably to 0.3. And this looks much better. So I think I'll go with this. 
I have a nice interior detail as well. So for now, let's turn off the edge detail. And I may also want a little bit more scattered points. So let's take a look at the overall size of the pieces. Again, this is just the first pass. So we have breaking all across the board. And after this, we would typically use constraint and additional fracturing to control where we want the building to break and where we want the smaller details to show. So let's increase the number of points. So now I will turn on the manual update, change the number of points to 2000. And for now, I will turn off the exploded view. I will click on my scattered points and go back to my auto update to have a faster feedback. So remember our plan, we wanted to create some fractures just between the columns of the lower stories. So I will go into the front view by pressing spacebar three. I will also template my building. And I will create a plane or a grid object where I will be able to scatter a few more points. So I will change the size of the grid to say 30 by 30 meters. I may have to transform it and move it up a bit. So press enter on your perspective just to be able to manipulate it. And I'll make sure to put it exactly on the center of this column. And then I will apply an extrude, in this case a poly extrude node, just to give it some thickness. So let's try with a distance of one meter. Make sure that output back and back group are on. Because I want to extrude again, so I will add another poly extrude. In this case, I will only extrude the back face. And what I will do is copy the amount of extrusion from the first node and paste it as a reference. So I can also control the inferior extrusion. Just so we have a symmetrical box. So this is looking good. I'm going to multiply this box a few more times. I will use a copy and transform node. Just to copy it a few more times, maybe twice. One for the second story and one for the third story. So the total number of copies will be three. And I will manually increase the height just about there. Now that we have our boxes in position, I will again convert this into a VDB. So press shift and drag the lower node to be able to move the nodes from above. And I will press tab and look for the VDB convert from polygons. Again, make sure it's a density fog. And just And one thing I'm going to do before I scatter my points is combine this VDB with the previous VDB we had ma we made. I will intersect them together so we have So 
so we have the new scattered points only where needed. So lay down a uh, combined VDB. Connect the first volume into the first input of the BDB combine and the second volume to the second input. Now under the VDB combine parameters, make sure that operation is set to activity intersection. To activity intersection. Okay, so this is looking good. I will add another scatter. So this time I will turn off the relax iterations. Remember, this will give us a more irregular distribution of points, which usually looks more natural. And again, I will increase the amount of points to say 4,000. So let's now add a merge node and let's combine our previous points with this second group of points that we have just generated. And I will connect this merge into the fourth input of my RBD material fracture. So let's see what we have so far. I will zoom out a bit. So notice how here in the center of the columns we have smaller pieces. This will look very interesting when the building starts to crumble. And not only that, it will also allow the building to break much more easily in these areas. So Again, let's turn off the exploded view. I will go back to my merged points. And finally, what I want to do is a more finer pass exactly where the walls will break. So I just want a very thin fissure on the breaking point of the walls. So what we can do is to copy this geometry we just created. And I will make it thinner using a peak node. So probably I'll use minus 0.8 meters. Let me compare them. Probably I can go even lower to 0.9. And again, I will convert this into a volume to scatter more points. Now, notice before we do that, how the camera is facing only on the corner of the building. So maybe we do not need to generate this much amount of pieces. Probably we can create a bounding box just to limit where the new points will be. So let's do that now. Let's create a box object. Let's go to the top view and let's move the box or actually scale it up just on the corner of the building. Again, let me template the building. Go to the top view and notice I will only use the corner of the building. Probably something like this. So let's add a Boolean node and intersect the boxes that we first created with this new box. So remember, by default, we have the intersect operation, which is fine in this case. And let's now convert again this object to a VDB. Let's 
make sure it's a fog VDB. And again, we will intersect this volume with the very first volume we created, this one. So let's add a VDB combine. Connect the first volume to the first input and the second volume to the second input. And now make sure that the operation again is set to activity intersection. So this is looking good. Let's add our scatter node. And this time we'll go a bit crazy with a number of points. Let's turn off the relax iterations and let's create Let's say 25,000. Okay, so let's merge these new points and take a look at our exploded view. Okay, so that fracturing took a couple of minutes, but if you take a look at the corners, especially here where the columns will break, we have plenty of detail and I think this is going to work fine. At this point, we may want to save this file. So I will lay down our ROP geometry output. Connect it to this first input of the RBD material fracture and change the name of this node to building fracture V zero one for version one and make sure to save it in our geo folder so i will change the name to dollar sign os which is the name of the node i will delete the frame number because this will be a single frame and click on the save to disk finally i will lay down a file note i will turn it blue and I can load the file directly here, or I can also channel reference the output name of the wrapped geometry output into the geometry file of this node. So here we have our saved geometry. There are two more things I want to do before we finish this tutorial. First of all, create a saved version of the detailed geometry. And this might take some time, but I'll show you real quick what I would do. So I'm going to go back to the RBD material fracture node. I will copy this output geometry node. And I will name this building fracture high res version one. Now, I will turn on the manual update and turn on the edge detail for the RBD material fracture node. And now I will save this version with this new name to later use it with our rendering. So I will pause the video and will come back when that version is ready. It took a few minutes to generate the detailed version, but here we have it now. I will lay down another file node. This time I will channel reference the output file name of this second node and paste it as a relative reference to this second file node. So let's take a look at the exploded view. And here we have the high resolution geometry. And I think it's looking fine. One last thing I want to do is to quickly create an RBD test to have an idea of how the demolition will look like. So I will use a low resolution version for that. I will add a null object and I will call it out. I will also change it color to black and I will actually change the name to out 
fractured building. So let's quickly jump out of the geometry node. And with the node selected, let's go into the rigid bodies tab and control click on the RBD fractured object. Make sure to click on the RBD packed object. I will also go to the collisions tab and control click on the ground plane. We could also look through the actual camera that we're going to use for rendering. And let's press play. So again, this may take some time. I may pause the video in a while, but it's good to create this kind of tests before committing to a final geometry. And although we would still have to create constraints and some other conditions, by creating early tests, we will have a very good idea of what to expect. Okay, so we have a few simulated frames now. And as we expected, where we had smaller pieces, there is a faster breaking. So notice how where we have larger pieces, the, the structure is holding up much more. Of course, a final simulation would need much more work, but this is giving us a very good idea of how the collapsing would look like. So this pretty much covers what I wanted to teach you in this first tutorial. Of course, we have plenty of more tutorials ahead of us. And as mentioned before, I would like to continue working on this shot till we have a very nice and finished product. So hopefully you will keep practicing what you learned. I would suggest to continue breaking up the building and trying to control where the fractures are. And of course, to keep practicing with these new techniques and see how far you can take them. It has been a pleasure for me creating this tutorial for you. And I hope to see you soon in future Total Destruction tutorials. Hello and welcome back. This time we will be talking about the new features in Houdini 18 in terms of fracturing. So I have here a very simple scene that I have designed. So we're going to start fracturing this diamond shape. And if you see, I only have a light table, just in case you want to render the exercise. I have a base for the diamond shape and the diamond itself. I also have placed a camera and a few lights. Again, just in case you want to try and render it by yourself, that's fine. In the meantime, I will close this backdrop. I will dive into the diamond geometry and I will show you it's a very simple setup. I just have a sub network with the actual modeling I did, then a transform to place it uh, on top of this base and a null as usual. I use a null to create an output. And here I have placed a few of the new nodes that we're going to be talking about. Well, actually the RBD material fracture is not new. We have worked already with that, but it has a few enhancements as of Houdini 18. And these three new nodes, uh, they are completely new to the, this new version and we will be talking about them in a few minutes. So let's start by connecting the RBT material fracture node. And you will notice here, so if I zoom into the fourth input, it says extra Voronoi point, which it had already. But now to the right, it says cutter geometry. So I'm speaking about this small text that appears. So this is something new. And of course, I will be talking about it. So let's create the connection. Of course, um, I think we will create our own scatter points. But just remember, the RBD material fracture by default can already fracture the geometry. So let me hide the other objects. I will hide other objects in the viewport just to make clear the point and to make sure that uh, you understand what I'm talking about. And now I will connect this new node that's called RBD Exploded View. Actually, I will do it from scratch. So type the tab key and type RBD Exploded View. 
So we can connect the RBD material fracture to the new node. And notice by default it will only connect one single port and the RBD exploded view has three ports. What I recommend you to do is connect all three and you can do that in several ways. Let me actually create this node again. So select the RBD material fracture node and start typing RBD exploded view and you can press shift enter. This will connect all three ports at once. Another thing that I like to do, I will disconnect them all. So I'll press Y and drag on the connections to disconnect them. Another thing that you can do is click on the first port of your RBD material fracture and then shift click on the rest of the ports and then click on the first connection of the RBD exploded view. And this is something you can do with all these new uh, nodes that have multiple ports and are linked together. So by default you will notice nothing new really. It's This appears to be exactly the same as the exploded view that we had before. But let me select the node to see its options. And notice by default it says show proxy geometry. So let's go back to the RBD material fracture and let's add some detail. So I will click on Edge Detail. I will increase the height just to make this more evident. And now you can see clearly that here this white wireframe, it's coming from the RBD exploded view, is showing us the proxy geometry that has been generated by the RBD material fraction node. So remember all these new nodes are created to work together with this new uh, rigid body dynamics workflow. Another very interesting thing that you can do is check on the show constraints and this will show all the constraints, all the connections that have been created again within the RBD material fracture node. So it is clear for example the amount of connections that you have or where the connections are stronger or weaker. So let's click on the visualize property and select constraint strength for example. And notice you will have a range going from blue to red. So blue would be a value of 2000. That would be the minimum strength of these connections, of these constraints. And the red would be the maximum strength of almost 9,000. So also the RBD material fracture creates some variation on the strength connection and you can see it very clearly here. For example, uh, on the top right you see the blue color and more towards the bottom you see the red. Also if you had for example uh, constraint stiffness or constraint angular stiffness you could visualize it here. Uh, for now it's uh, unspecified, but just in case you had those attributes, you could visualize them here. Let's again go to the visualize properties and this time let's select the pieces option. So this may be familiar to you with the visualize pieces option. You will have a random color for e each of the pieces on the fracture. So this also can be very useful. And finally, you can show the actual convex holes that will be created when simulating. So let me turn off the constraints and the proxy geo. And if you click on the show convex holes, this would be the convex hole created for the actual simulation. So this is very useful to see here directly, even before you start simulating. Finally, a nice interesting option that we have here is a random rotate. This will allow you to rotate the pieces in case you want to see, for example, the interior faces of one of the pieces or just to have a better sense of the contours and the shapes. And of course, we also have the uniform scale. That's the common attribute on the exploded view. So this is for the RBD exploded view node. It may look like a simple addition, but I'm sure that you will be using it every single time you're creating fracturing for your destruction.
Let's now talk about the RBD material fracture nodes chipping option. So chipping is not something that we didn't have before. It's just that it has been enhanced and now it's a very useful parameter to have in the RBD material fracture. So let's add uh, the chipping attribute. So actually I mentioned that I would create my own scatter points. So I will create an ISO offset node. I will increase the resolution to say 60. And then we'll connect the scatter node. And of course we don't need that many points. I will reduce the number of points to say 20. And connect the points to the fourth input on the RBD material fracture. So back in the material fracture node, I will just use the input points. So I'll reduce the scatter points to zero. I will click on the input points. Actually, I also need to delete the second layer. So we're just using the scattered points. So click on the input points. And again, I will create an RBD exploded view. Shift enter to connect it. And I'll move it a bit to the left. So I usually like to click on the pieces to create the random colors we just talked about. And for now, I'll change the uniform scale to zero. And back on the RBD material fracture node, I will look for the chipping option and turn it on. So you probably remember from lesson number four, we did turn on the chipping option for the node in Houdini 17.5. But to be honest, it didn't work quite well. I actually didn't use it really in production. Uh, it generated kind of like uh, random smaller pieces here and there but they really didn't look very natural. Now, the new uh, chipping option is very nice. And let me, for a moment, turn off the colored pieces and zoom into these corners here. So notice how there have been created a few smaller pieces where the corners of the larger pieces are. So they're not like random pieces here and there. Uh, the chipping option tries to look where we have sharp angles or larger angles and it will not only create small pieces there, it will also start to round the shapes a little bit more. So here you can see this large piece has been rounded a little bit with these new pieces. So you can increase the chipping ratio so this will create more chips. Of course, you could reduce this number, but usually you can bring it very high. I'm going to try with 0.9. Of course, you can change the seat if you are not completely happy with the arrangement of the pieces. You can also increase the corner ratio, which would create uh, more rounded pieces overall. And it has a few other options, the corner depth and the directional noise. I haven't seen much change with these options, but you can experiment. Uh, overall, I really like this new feature. Uh, I have been using it a lot. Now when I create concrete, I usually turn it on. So let me go back to my exploded view. And you will notice how in between these larger pieces, lots of smaller pieces have been created. And not, not only that, also we will uh, get a new set of constraints for the chips that are usually set with a lower strength value than the other pieces. So th these small chips will be the first one to fall apart when, you, when doing an RBD simulation. And it usually looks very natural. So give it a try and I'm sure you will find it very useful in your future RBD simulations. We will now talk about the custom shape fracturing within the RBD material fracture node.
And this is something very similar to what we did in chapter three. So now you can use any custom shape that you want to cut through your geometry to fracture it. And as we have already seen, this makes fracturing very art directable and very controllable. So let me show you an example. I will create a grid. I will template the diamond and move the grid upward so it intersects with the diamond. I will also rotate it and maybe decrease the size a bit. I will go back to my RBD material fracture node and I will change the material type to custom. Now, one thing you need to do is connect this geometry to the fourth input of the RBD material. And now you will notice we have a new cut here. I will activate the RBD exploded view. And this is where the plane is intersecting the diamond. And of course, you could always modify this geometry. We can add a mountain, as we did before, just to add some interior detail. Or you could even use 3D geometry, and it should work. So let me try with a sphere. Let's create a polygon sphere. Bring it a bit up and probably to the left. And we could even try merging it. So let's merge the grid that we already have with a sphere. So there you go. And although this technique is very similar to what we could do before, now we can integrate this into the new RBD workflow. And with one simple node, we will be generating our constraints, our proxy geo, and all the good stuff that comes with the RBD material fracture node. I will now talk about two new nodes that, although they are used for several things, their main purpose or the main thing that I will be using it for is to fix the fracturing in transparent objects. So let me show you an example. I have pre-fractured this diamond and I have rendered it with and without fracturing. This frame is without the fracturing applied and the next frame is with the fracturing applied. So here you will notice that we can see the interior faces and this is causing a lot of inner reflections and inner refractions. And of course, this doesn't look right, especially if you have an animation where uh, you have the complete diamond and then you're going to shatter it or break it somehow. So let me show you the final animation and what I would like to achieve. So if I hit play here, you'll notice how as the diamond falls, it looks complete. You won't see the interior faces, but once it starts breaking, so here on this first frame where it breaks, you can start seeing the interior faces. And as it continues breaking, the new faces will start being visible. So this is a very useful tool. Of course, you could do this before, um, mainly with compositing tricks or with animation. You could animate the position or the visibility of the geometry, or even what I used to do was in comp, I would uh, render two passes, one with the shattering and one without the shattering, and you could just switch them at the right time. But this will help us to do everything within the Houdini environment without additional keyframing or custom tricks. So let me minimize this. 
and I have gone ahead and created a series of points just to share the point of the diamond and I will connect this to the RBD material fracture node. I may need to change this to concrete. I could also use uh, glass but just to show you it doesn't really matter if you're using glass or wood or concrete the technique will work regardless of the material type you're using. So let me again hide the rest of the object. Go to my RBD exploded view. And here are my new shards. These are the new pieces that are being generated. And if we tried rendering this, let me go to the render view, select my camera, and I have already created a mantra node. So if you go to the output, this is a mantra node that will be rendering the scene. So of course I won't wait for the scene to render. It's taking quite some time to render. Uh, this is why, <coughs> sorry, I have the, the examples here pre-rendered. So this is what you're going to get once the diamond is fractured. So if we turn off this node, you'll get the complete diamond, just as we saw here. So what I'm going to do to fix this, and actually I'm going to change to a wireframe. Again, I'm going to turn on the RBT material fracture node. And I will probably change to my other scattered points just to generate more pieces. So here you can see the interior pieces that are causing this uh, rendering trouble. So let me real quick create an RBD simulation. This is something that we will talk about in volume two of this series, but let me for now just make a quick test. Type RBD solver. And I will connect my RBD material fracture node to the solver. Now within the solver, I will turn on the ground plane. And just hit play. Now it's creating some constraints. I don't really need the constraints. So I will just disconnect port 2 and 3. And there we have a quick test simulation. Okay, so I'm going to add on RBD disconnect faces node. And I will also add on RBD connected faces node. So these nodes work together. First of all, I need to plug in the RBD connected faces and this will generate the list of faces that are being created and it will assign them an attribute called face ID. It will also create an attribute called prim dist that is measuring the distance or the position between each of these faces and the distance between them. So let me show you in a more practical way. It's easier if I show you here with the example. I will simulate a few frames. And if I go to my geometry spreadsheet and click here on the primitives, you will notice that now we have this face ID and the distance. Actually, I accidentally changed the name, so I will control and middle click this uh, distance attribute to revert it to the default name. So here we have the prim dist, which is the distance between each primitives and the value will be very, very low. Most of them will be zero. Actually, all of them are zero. These are very, very low values. And now we can go back to the scene view and I will connect 
the RBD disconnected faces after the simulation. So notice how by default nothing really happens, at least apparently. What this node is doing is it's creating an attribute called disconnected. So again, let's go back to our spreadsheet. And here under the primitives, you will notice we have this new attribute called disconnected. And on frame 16, all of the primitives have a value of one. If I go back to frame one, notice how most of them have a value of zero. Not all of them, but most of them. And if we take a look at our geometry here, we could change the mode to delete disconnected. Sorry, uh, delete connected. So rather than just creating the attribute, we are literally this, uh, sorry, deleting the interior faces altogether. So let's try playing the simulation. And notice how the faces, the interior faces, will immediately appear when they are separated more than this distance, uh, which the default value is very, very low. So the moment this, they start separating from each other, the interior faces will appear. We could try increasing this value, and you'll notice how now we cannot see most of them. But usually you want to keep this very low value. So this is how this animation was generated. I'm just using the default value. And the moment it starts breaking, the interior faces will appear and will be rendered. So again, here we cannot see the faces. In frame 9 there was a contact. Let me go back to my custom point. So here the lower pieces are starting to break. Let me reduce this threshold. Actually increase it, sorry. So here we only see the lower pieces being displayed. And as a upper pieces start to separate, the inner faces will start to appear again. So although this technique is very useful for rendering transparent objects, you can also use these attributes that are being generated to create some effects. For example, we could change the mode to uh, create attribute. And probably when we have a disconnection between these pieces, we could generate some debris or particles or even create a fluid simulation with this flagged primitives.